Okay, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Uh, today we are continuing our series, uh, I Surrender All? Question um, mark. And last week we looked more at the idea of are we completely submitted to our creator or is the unfortunate reality that we've surrendered some, right? Some of us may be lucky enough to say I've surrendered most. I don't know. That doesn't, I don't think that's me just yet, if I'm being brutally honest uh, with where I'm at now. But we're all in this process of learning what it means to become more surrendered to our king. And as most of us are well aware that his commands encompass quite a wide area of our lives. In fact, I would say they're all encompassing, like his Torah, his righteousness is laid down to us through his Torah. And it does govern all aspects of our life. It should. That's the ideal situation. Uh, but we in our fallen state, we, we struggle and add to that, that we're in a scattered reality. Uh, add to that, that our forefathers have inherited lies we're now in this place where we're so far removed from the origins of our faith that we're having to basically rediscover uh, what it means to be his covenanted people. And due to the nature of his ways being all encompassing in our lives and due to the fact that there's so many areas of our lives uh, that are governed by Torah, we're going to look at different key areas and by no means will it be exhaustive but it, I, I i want to hit kind of the main ones uh last week was more of a general introduction of what it means to to give one's hand unto elohim to to put the hand under the throne and are we putting our hand in submission under him or are we raising it above him and quote unquote sitting with a high hand um, and one thing I found, at least that's true in my life and journey is that as I grow, I've come to realize that I wasn't surrendered in all aspects of my life. And one of the key places that people struggle in the faith is with marriage. Now I know we've done marriage ad nauseum, um, you know, whether it be design, whether it be authority, I want to take a very different angle to it. And actually today, I want to look at more of a practical aspect to the two shall become one. Because look, all of us know the scripture that says, in fact, we're going to open up with it, that the two shall become one flesh. And we understand that principle on a mental level. But quite often people say to me, okay, Michael, I understand what you're trying to say. How does this play out in 3D? How does this actually apply to me? What are some of the more practical aspects in regards to this? So today I want to look at, again, by no means an exhaustive look at marriage, because if not, we'd be here for eternity, right? Um, but I want to look at some broader principles that a husband and a wife may be able to discuss among themselves and learn to apply. Um, Again, as we go through this teaching, remember that marriage between a husband and wife is the shadow picture of the weightiest spiritual matter, which is Messiah and his bride. Messiah will have a bride that will govern with him. And if we don't understand the shadow picture, we're going to struggle with the weight with the weightier matter. And if we haven't um learn to overcome in certain areas of our lives, especially in regards to marriage, you know, how are we going to then know how to apply this at the most important level, which look, let's be honest, by the end of the thousand years, you have a second death as one of the possible outcomes for those being judged. So this is a really serious matter. All of a sudden marriage is, again, it's more than just having a functional marriage. It, it should go beyond that. Uh, but we are here in this fallen time domain. We're not yet in the way to your shadow picture. So we need to wrestle with some of the practicalities of surrendering, not only to Elohim's design, but of a husband and wife surrendering to each other. One of the, you know, we all know the statements, wives submit to your husbands. 
who he realizes that husbands in some degree need to submit to their wives. I know this sounds almost counterintuitive, but just because the two are submitted one to another does not mean it doesn't take away from a husband's headship role, for example. And hopefully this will become a bit clearer as we go through today. So let's jump in. We're going to read some scriptures that we're well aware of. Obviously, we have to go through this and we're not going to dwell too much time on these. Genesis 2.23, the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one is called woman because she was taken out of man. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and they shall become one flesh. We all know this verse. We 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 recite it like we, we've gone. Uh, most people tuning in have gone through the design teachings, but yet again, it's this question of I know the spiritual principle. How does this look as I live my life? What are the practical aspects to this? Uh, of which it, there are many, too many to cover through in this teaching. Hence, why I want to take a broader bird's eye view on this. First Peter 3. Again, these are scriptures that are banded around, um, but let's read them. In the same way, wives be subject to your own husbands. If you read the end of First Peter chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 says that basically, I'm paraphrasing here, but Yeshua is the shepherd and we had gone astray like sheep and now we're coming back into the fold and we're learning what it means to be uh people of Elohim, with Yeshua being the shepherd, which means there's an authority kind of idea being talked about. And so when Peter says, in the same way, he's referring back to what he's just said, that actually there's a kingdom authority at play in the house of Israel. Now, unfortunately, these verses are banded around and turned into the subjugation of women, which is not biblical. Women are not to be subjugated. There's a very big difference between subjugation and submission. Very big difference. But we'll get to that later. In the same way, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that if any are disobedient to the word, they without a word might be won by the behavior of their wives, having seen your blameless behavior in fear. Your adornment should not be outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on dresses, but the hidden man of the heart with the incorruptible ornament of a meek and peaceable spirit, which is of great value before Elohim. Notice that the women have a, a greater propensity to learn what meekness is than the men because of the authority structure. Now, who is it that inherits the earth? The meek will inherit the earth. Ladies, you actually have an advantage at learning what meekness is over the men. You know, so bear that in mind. For in this way, in former times, the set-apart women who trusted in Elohim also adorned themselves, being subject to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Avraham, calling him master, of whom you became children doing good and not frightened by any fear. And then people like to stop there. Right, but let's keep reading. In the same way, husbands live understandingly together. In the same way as what? What has Peter just gone through? Wives, you need to be subject to your husbands. But Peter then goes, men, in the same way, like again, like I'm gonna I I, I said I said this earlier, but people sometimes overlook the fact that there is a certain amount of submission from both parties yes we know scripture says wives submit to your husbands men did you know that actually there's a certain amount of submission on your end to your wives again this doesn't take away the, the fact that the husband is the head of the family but I, I will explain what i mean in a bit more detail as we go through the more practical aspects but Husbands, live understandingly together, giving respect to the wife. In fact, you should be giving so much respect to your wife that she should be number two in your life, Elohim be number one. Elohim needs to be number one, then it's the wife, then it's the kids, then it's you. Self should be last in this. Like, you know, 
wives should hold the greatest position of authority in a husband's life. Baya, baya. That goes without say. Giving respect to the wives as to the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of the favor of life so that your prayers are not hindered. Notice that you are co-heirs together. Okay. We know the verse that Paul says, in Messiah Yeshua, there is no Jew nor Greek nor Gentile. There's no male nor female, but that's in Messiah. And I believe that that's pointing to the glorified reality. Okay. But right now we're not in a glorified state. Okay. We're not in a glorified state. And Yah has given us a pattern to follow to help us with our fallen state. He's given us this pattern because he knows we're in a fallen state. And he says, this is how I want you to operate while you are fallen. But notice that the man and the wife are heirs together, not one over the other. It's just that right now we live in a fallen reality. And he says, you do this so that your prayers are not hindered. Where is Peter getting this idea from? Well, he's going to explain himself if we keep reading on. Now, notice that Peter has addressed the body dynamic. Well, that's at the end of chapter two. And then in chapter three, then he, dis he discusses the marriage dynamic. And then he's going to make some statements. To sum up, let all of you be like-minded, sympathetic, loving as brothers, tender-hearted, humble-minded. Do you need to be humble-minded for your marriage to be functional? What happens when one of the spouses is not humble-minded? Why is Peter even saying this directly after marriage talk? Right? What happens if you're not tender-hearted? What if you're hard-hearted? You know, men tend to be more prone to be hard-hearted than women generally. Again, I'm speaking in broad brushstrokes here. But notice he's saying right after marriage, you guys need to be humble-minded. You Look, marriage has humbled me. Praise the Father, it has humbled me for, for, for my benefit. And the more humble I become, the more my wife is benefited by my growing humility. Be humble-minded, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Isn't that the definition of an argument? You know, husbands, wives, who here, you've gotten in a tiff, and you've bitten the bullet, you, you, the carrot's being dangled in front of you, so to speak, and you've bit the carrot, and you end up saying something that as soon as it comes out your mouth, you're like, I shouldn't have said anything. Do not return evil for evil or reviling for reviling. I imagine this within the context of marriage. But on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this in order to inherit a blessing, like knowing that you were called to what? Peter's just gone and said, husbands, respect your wives. Why? Because you're going to be co-heirs of the favor that is to come. That's what we've been called to, being heirs of the kingdom. And he says, because that's what's coming, we need to work some stuff out now. We need to work it out now. Because again, remember, the marriage is a shadow picture of what is yet to come, of Messiah and his bride ruling and governing from Zion. And there's going to be a whole millennial reign that are going to need some serious wisdom. And if we're not learning it now, well, where is it going to come from? And it seems to be that marriage is one of the biggest ways to, to learn this wisdom and to learn this dynamic. For he who wishes to love life and see the good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Like now he's quoting a passage in scripture. He's um, He's quoting one of the Psalms. Let's keep going. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Now, what did we just read earlier? Let's go back. Um, where is it? Do you want peace in a marriage? Well, of course you do. In fact, I think it's in the... Um, oh, never mind. I'm getting myself muddled up. But... In the context of marriage, you need to know to not uh, return evil for evil. On the contrary, blessing, know that you were called to this. What? The blessing of the favor that is yet to come. So in the meantime, keep your tongue from evil and seek peace. Okay. 
This is not about becoming a doormat or keeping the peace for the sake of it. But again, like think of a marriage that is starting to get in a bit of a rut or that's starting to get dysfunctional and the spouses are backbiting one and uh, one another and being passive aggressive. And Peter's saying, quit all that. Seek peace. Do not return evil for evil. Be humble minded. Respect the wives. You know, wives, respect your husbands, seek peace, pursue it, pursue it. Because if you're truly seeking peace in the marriage, you're going to start having to work through certain issues where you may be struggling. Because the eyes of Yah are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of Yah is against those who do evil. This is where Peter is getting the idea from. That husbands, if you don't live understandably, understandably with your wives, your prayers are going to be hindered. And how is that defined by the psalmist? Keep your tongue from evil. Seek peace and pursue it. And Peter's using this psalm within a marriage context. Are you backbiting one another? Are you reviling one another? Are you being proud and arrogant and needing to be right? Because if that's the place your marriage is in, oh, I'm going to show him or I'm going to show her, your prayers are going to be hindered. And this is where Paul, uh, Peter is getting this idea from. Because if you're not seeking peace, if your tongue is producing evil, Yah's ears is going to be closed to your prayers. You know, and this is where you get the idea that, you know, let's pick on the men first. If you think that Yah's going to hear your prayer, but yet you're slandering your wife and you're subjugating her and you're mocking her to your friends and you're not respecting her as a co-heir to the favor of eternal life, good luck with your prayer life. In the same way, ladies, if you think that you and Yeshua are best buddies and Yeshua is your husband, but yet you're usurping him, good luck with your prayer life. This, this is two ways. Peter is holding both the men and the women equally accountable. Equally. It takes two to tango. It takes two to make a good marriage. It takes two to, to break a marriage apart. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Verse 15, and if the unbelieving one separates, let him separate himself. A brother or a sister has not been enslaved in such matters, but Elohim has called us to peace. I bring this up because a lot of people will say to me, well, should I submit even if my husband is being abusive? Like, this is not what it's talking about, okay? Elohim has called us to peace. If the unbelieving one wants to go, let them go. OK, so this is not a thing of becoming a punch bag or a doormat or being, you know, taking the verbal abuse. Like This is not what we're talking about here. OK, like, again, biblical submission is very, very different to subjugation. For how do you know, O wife, whether you shall save your husband or how do you know, O husband, whether you shall save your wife? But again, Paul quantifies it. If they want to leave, let them leave. You've not been enslaved. Elohim is an Elohim of peace. Remember what Peter said, seek peace and pursue it. Okay. Amos 3.3, 3, would two walk together without having met? In other translations, it will say, uh, how can two walk together without being in agreement? Okay. Think of this at the marriage level. If the two are not in agreement, and I'm not talking about disagreeing about where the next holiday is. Like, this is talking about being on the same path. This is talking about being equally yoked, okay? These types of things. Would two walk together without having met? I love, if you look at the Septuagint version of this verse, it says, would two walk together having been made known to each other? This idea of do you actually know each other? And obviously the term knowing being used of conjugational relations, okay? Would two walk together without being intimate is what Amos is really trying to say. This can apply at the marriage level. It can apply at the fellowship level. It can apply at the Elohim level. It can apply, think of 
the curses of Leviticus, of disobedience. If you walk contrary to me, I will walk contrary to you, he says. But if you walk with me and you know me, I will walk beside you. Okay, let's look at a couple of biblical examples. Um, we're going to look at 1 Samuel 25. This is the account of David and Abigail, because I've had quite a few people come to me over the over the years saying, well, did Abigail usurp her husband and all this kind of stuff? So let's actually read what Abigail did and what she didn't and all this kind of stuff. And we're going to see actually a side to it that most people have overlooked completely and we're going to see what a true godly woman looks like in the context of marriage and this woman being married to a fool as we're going to read the name of the man this is abigail's husband was naval now naval means foolishness or folly okay and the name of his wife was avigail abigail it means the joy of my father and she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful, but the man was hard and evil in his doings, and he was of Caleb, of Caleb. And David said to his men, each one gird on his sword. Now, I've go read the story, but basically David is, he, he needs some food, he needs some supplies. And David had been defending uh, Naval's uh, flocks and herds, making sure that they weren't getting hit by robbers and stuff like that. And he's just asking for some for some goods. Now Naval says, "Well, who's David? You know, who's David? What's he ever done for me?" So David gets the hump and he's like, "Right, that's it. You know, here we've been wasting our time protecting Naval and all this, and this is how he repays us. Let's do something about it." So that, just so people understand each one girded on his sword so they each girded on his sword and david also girded on his sword and about 400 men went with david and 200 remained with the baggage and david had said only in vain have i protected all that this one has in the wilderness so that not a speck was missing of all that belongs to him and he has repaid me evil for good so this is why david's got the hump let Elohim do so and more also to the enemies of David if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. So David now in his anger is actually making an oath here, which is pretty dangerous, especially making oaths from like a, a very emotionally charged place. And Abigail saw David and she hastened to come down from the donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground and fell at his feet and said, on me, my master, let this crookedness be on me. And please let your female servant speak in your ears and hear the words of your female servant. So what is she doing? Abigail is interceding on behalf of her husband, despite him being a fool, despite him having actually done some wrong. She's interceding for him. Please let not my master regard this man of Belial, Naval, for as his name is, so is he. Naval is his name and folly is with him. But I, your, so look, she's, she's stating the truth here. Yes, my husband's a bit of a fool, but don't let, let this be on me. She's actually taking on the sin, so to speak. She's interceding on his behalf to the future king. But I, your female servant, did not see the young men of my master whom you sent. And now my master, as Yah lives and as your being lives, since Yah has withheld you from coming to bloodshed, and from avenging yourself with your own hand. Now then, let your enemies be as Naval, even those seeking evil against my master. Abigail is saying to David, do not take matters into your own hands. You've got to remember that by this stage of the story of David's life, it the whole of Israel knows that David has been anointed to become king, but he's not yet king. Okay, Saul is still reigning. But all of Dave, all of Israel would have also heard of how David acted with Saul. 
You know, remember that Saul was trying to kill him and twice David had Saul's life in his own hands. And he says, but I will not lay my hands on the anointed of Yah. He says, Yah will deal with you. I'm not going to do it. Elohim will deal with you. That news would have gone around to all of Israel. Everyone would have known about it. And now David, he's gotten angry with Naval. And he's like, right, that's it. I'm killing him and all the males. And Abigail very wisely realized, hang on a minute. He's very close to, he's taking matters into his own hands. And this is what Abigail is doing to David. She's saying, not only is she interceding for her foolish husband, she's saying, do not take matters in your own hands. Please do not do this. And now this present, which your female servant has brought to my master, let it be given to the young men who follow my master. Please forgive the transgression of your female servant. For Yah is certainly making a steadfast house for my master, because my master fights the battles of Yah, and evil is not found in you all of your days. Again, like she's saying, look, up until now, you have been blameless in your dealings. In fact, you've allowed your enemies to be dealt with by Yah. You've not tried to kill them. And he, she's literally saying, up until now, you're without fault. Do not change that. Do not avenge yourself with your own hand, because if not, you every, all the good you've done up until now will be gone in an instant. And if a man rises to pursue you and seek your life, and the life of my master has been bound in the bundle of the living with Yah your Elohim, then the lives of your enemies he shall sling out. Not David, Elohim shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Notice what she's saying. She's saying, so far, David, your enemies, Yah's dealt with them. If it so happens that my husband has to be dealt with, Yah will do it. But don't you do it, David, because if not, you're taking matters into your own hands. And even like notice what Abigail's doing. She's interceding for her husband. She's preventing David from taking matters into his own hands so that he, you know, it doesn't tarnish his reputation because she knows he's going to be king. But she's like, notice the life of her own husband. She's saying, I'm not the one to deal with it. Elohim is. All of a sudden, you realize that Abigail's not usurping in the slightest. And it shall be when Yah has done for my master according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has commanded you to be ruler over Israel. So, again, like everyone knew this, and everyone would have known how David dealt with stuff, that it was without fault. And Abigail's saying, Don't change that now, David. Not for your sake, for Yah's sake. Do not let this be a staggering and stumbling of heart to my master, that you have shed blood without cause, or that my master has saved himself. She's saying, don't take matters into your own hands, David. Yah will deal with my husband, not you. Ask yourself now the question, is she usurping her husband? Far from it. She's saving his backside. She's covering for him. Ladies with foolish husbands, is this the example you've been giving? This is what Peter is talking about when he says, wives, subject yourselves to your husbands, even to the crooked ones. What if you win them over with your good behavior? He's not saying be a doormat. He's not saying just accept the torrent of abuse that's coming on. No, look at what Abigail is doing. She's leaving her husband in Yah's hands and she's warning David, don't take matters into your own hands. And when Yah has done good to my master, then remember your female servant. And David said to Abigail, blessed be Yah Elohim of Israel, who sent you to meet me today. And blessed is your good taste and blessed are you. So when they say uh, blessed is your good taste, this is a Hebrew idiom for discernment. OK, because you discern with your taste. Right. Is this sweet or sour? David is saying, well done, you discerning woman. You've discerned this and you've wisely assessed this. 
Blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. This is not like this has got nothing to do with Abigail usurping her husband. This is everything to do with Abigail covering and interceding for her husband and warning David, do not take matters into your own hands. Nevertheless, as Yah Elohim of Israel lives, who has kept me back from doing evil to you, if you had not hurried to come to meet me, not a mayor would have been left to Navar by break of day for certain. I actually believe you're seeing a type and shadow here of the bride of Messiah interceding. It's, it's an amazing picture. And David received from her hand what she had brought him. And he said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have listened to your voice and accepted your face. He sent her back to a foolish husband. Is David now usurping? No, he's not. He's respecting that she's a married woman. And she goes back to her husband. Let, let's keep reading. Abigail went to Naval and see, he was at the feast in his house like a feast of a sovereign. And Naval's heart was glad within him and he was exceedingly drunk. So she told him not a word, little or much, until morning light. Even though he was being a drunkard, she's like, now's not the time to deal with him. She's gone back to her husband. This, this is what it means to be a, a, a good wife leaving things unto Yah. And it came to be in the morning when the wine had gone from Naval and his wife had told him these matters that his heart died within him and he became like a stone. She even picked the right time to speak to him when he wasn't drunk or when he wasn't, you know, think emotionally charged or under the influence, what, like fill in the blank. She picked her time. She picked her time when it was right. And it came to be in about 10 days that Yah smote Naval and he died. Who took care of the husband? It was Yah. Like, look, Abigail knew her husband was a fool. But at the same time, she was still married to him and she respected him. She went and warned David, don't take matters into your own hands. Yes, my husband is a fool, but yet let Yah deal with him. Yah will deal with him. And then she went back home. And not only that, when she went back home, she didn't deal with him when he was drunk. She waited until he was sober. And David heard that Naval was dead. And he said, blessed be Yah, who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Naval and has kept his servant from evil, i.e. Yah prevented me from taking matters into my own hands. And he used Abigail to do it. For Yah has returned the evil of Naval on his own head. And David sent and spoke to Abigail to take her as his wife. Nowhere in this story is there any form of usurping. None. They did everything by the book, so to speak. But here you have a wife in, interceding for a foolish husband. But notice that she's not, she's not condoning his behavior either. Very interesting. I bring this up because, you know, people will say, well, Abigail usurped. There's no usurping here. You have wisdom being given here. Okay, let's look at another biblical example. We like to think of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the fathers of the faith, as, of, as having their house in order. It couldn't be further from the truth. Would it be shocking to you if I said to you that Abraham and Sarah had a dysfunctional marriage to begin with? They had a dysfunctional marriage. Let's read. Genesis 16 verse 1. And Sarai, Avram's wife, had borne him no child. Remember that by this stage, the promise of the seed has already been given to Abram. And she had a Mitzrian female servant, an Egyptian servant whose name was Hagar. And Sarai said to Avram, see, Yah has kept me from bearing children. Please go into my female servant. It might be that I am built up by her. And Avram listened to the voice of Sarai. Okay. Who here is taking matters into their own hands? It's Sarah. Sarah is actually showing a lack of faith here. She's fully aware of the promise of Elohim. 
that Abraham will be the father of many nations. She's now panicking. Why have I got no children? What's going on? You know what? And you can see the mental process. Well, maybe it's going to come through my female servant. You have Sarah here taking matters into her own hands, okay? And doing things in the flesh. Because remember that Isaac is the child of promise. He was born of faith. Like they were both beyond the age of bearing children when Isaac came. Now, obviously, Sarah hadn't factored this into mind, but Sarah is taking matters into her own hands. But is Sarah the only problem here? No. Abraham is the other problem. Abraham is not taking up his headship right here. If Abraham was really taking his headship, he would have said, Sarah, I know that you're struggling to understand how this promise is going to come about. To be honest, I'm struggling too, Sarah. But let's not take matters into our own hands. Let's have faith in Yah. So here you have Abraham hearkening to the voice of the woman. This is what Yah says to Adam, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. Okay. So now both parties are at fault. Sarah is taking matters into her own hands, and Abraham is not taking his headship up. And as a result of that, the situation is now being driven by Sarah. Now, who's to be the head of the house? It's the husband. So right here, we have a very, very subtle, under-the-surface usurping going on here. But we can't pin the blame on Sarah. Abraham is equally to blame for not taking his headship up. He should be correcting his wife lovingly and meekly, but he didn't. And Sarah, Sarai, Avram's wife, took Hagar, her female servant, the Mitzrian, and gave her to her husband, Avram, to be his wife. <laughs> After Avram had dwelt 10 years in the land of Canaan. So obviously they've been dwelling for 10 years and they're thinking, man, where are the kids coming from? You know what? Maybe Elohim needs a help from us. <laughs> we can help Elohim. Now, it sounds ridiculous to us looking back, but try to put yourself in their position. Sarah's body clock is ticking away. In fact, she's probably realized, I can't bear kids. It's one thing knowing Yah's promises. It's another thing living them. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when he saw that she had conceived, when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So she started to look down upon Sarah. Yah's blessed me. He's obviously not blessed you. I'm better than you. And Sarah said to Avram, my wrong be upon you. She's blaming Abraham for all of this. Now, technically, Abraham is half to blame. He didn't take his headship up in the first place. But who brought the situation to a head anyway? Right at the beginning, it was Sarah. Now, the word here for wrong in Hebrew is Hamas, okay? Hamas means violence wrong. It means cruelty. It also means injustice. Remember what, now that Hagar has conceived, she despises Sarah. So Sarah technically is being treated unfairly by Hagar. But Sarah is saying, Abraham, this is your fault. This is your fault. Actually, Sarah, it's half Abraham's fault. But you, you drove this. She's saying, I'm now being wronged and let it be upon you. In fact, she'll probably, you know, imagine Sarah saying, you didn't take your headship about in the first place. That's technically true. But she's the one that took matters into her own hands and then convinced Abraham to do so. So again, it takes two to tango here. My wrong be upon you. So she's not taking accountability for the fact that she spearheaded all of this. My wrong, be it, my injustice be upon you. I gave my female servant into your bosom. And when she saw that she had conceived, I was despised in her eyes. Let Yah judge between you and me. Like, let Yah judge between you and me. 
like what happened to being co-heirs of the favor of life? You can clearly see here that Sarah is acting purely from emotions. Like it makes no logical sense. But here's the thing. She's saying, this is your fault, Abraham. Let you, I've been unfairly treated. Well, technically that's true. But Sarah, this was your idea. What did you think would happen? So she's not taking accountability that she spearheaded this. She's just, she's more than happy though, at pointing out Abraham's fault. This doesn't sound like a, a, a healthy marriage, right? <laughs> Abram said to Sarai, see your female servant is in your hand. Do to her what is good in your eyes. And Sarai treated her harshly and she fled from her presence. Oh, Abraham, come on, dude. And here we see Abraham shirking his responsibility and headship again. If Abraham was truly being a good head, he would have called out Sarah's hypocrisy. In lovingness, in meekness and all of that. Yes, but a good head at this stage would have gone, well, Sarah, this was your idea. So, yes, you can point the finger at me for half of it for not taking up my headship. But this was your idea. What's Abraham doing? He's actually absconding responsibility. He doesn't want to deal with it. He says, you deal with it. Now, think about this. You now have Sarah, who's obviously vexed and she's in a highly charged emotional state, right, we all know the, the, the saying, hell has no fury like a woman's scorn. Sarah is clearly in that scornful place, and Abraham's saying, you deal with her. Like, of course bad stuff is going to come for this. You know, Imagine Sarah in this state now being on the judgment seat of Messiah and the second the power over the second death is in her hand. Hagar would have been toast. See you later, Hagar. Like, so again, like the fault is not only just on Sarah, but it's also on Abraham. Abraham was shirking his responsibility. He should have known better. Here's a li little interesting tidbit. Sarai uh, in Hebrew means prince, it, it means ruler, or it can mean dominative. Now, when you see Sarah have her name changed to Saha, it means princess. So it would seem that Sarah, through her name changes, went from being dominative to being a princess. I believe it's a picture of the bride of Elohim. That look, we the bride was in a usurping state, she overcame, and now she can be trusted. But at this stage, Abraham and Sarah have a usurped marriage. Sarah's driving things behind the scenes and not taking accountability for her actions, and then more than happy to point the finger at Abraham when things go wrong. But Abraham is not taking his headship seriously. And this is the father of the faith. Who was driving the whole situation? It was Sarah. And Abraham didn't have the spine to say, hold up, hold up. The, the outcome of this is that Hagar was harshly treated and sent away. Who allowed it? Abraham. Abraham could have stopped this. So you, let, let's not point the finger at Sarah. Let's not point the finger at Sarah. They were both equally to blame in this, should we say. Yes, Sarah drove it, but Abraham allowed it. They're both in the wrong. Usurping under the guise of submission. This is one of the most dangerous types of usurping. The amount of men... <laughs> I'm going to pick a low-hanging fruit here. The amount of Messianic Hebrew roots women that wear the little cover head covering and say, I'm submitted, yet are usurping their husbands the whole time? <laughs> I struggle with that. I struggle with that. But then they, let, let's pick on the men now. Men saying, oh, yeah, my wed my marriage is all fine and healthy. And actually, because the husband is not stepping up and doing anything, the wife is having to pick up the pieces behind him because no one else will. Usurping under the guise of submission, this is particularly damaging because it can go undetected for so long. 
neither were walking in their design. Neither of them. And actually, you can put a greater accountability maybe on Abraham. Because what was the what was part of the judgment pronounced on the woman at the fall? Your desire shall be for your husband, i.e. for his position. If the husband does not step up, the consequence of the fallen state is that the woman will step in, whether it be for right or for wrong. So Abraham has actually allowed this to happen. And it's, and it's happening right under his nose. I would argue the two had not fully become one. They had not fully become one. Because had they fully become one, had they fully submitted one to the other, none of this would have happened. Ephesians 5. We know where Paul says, wives subject to your husbands as the master. Let's pick on the men. Husbands, love your wives as Messiah also did love the assembly and gave himself for it. Messiah died for the assembly. Husbands, can you say the same for your wives? Are you dying day to day to yourself for your wife? In order to set it apart and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word. Husbands, you play a role in your wife's sanctification process. That's what this verse is saying. By the way, the washing of the water by the word, that does in involve reproof and correction. The word convicts us. It reproves us. Husbands, how are you going about it? Are you doing it with meekness and humility? Or are you doing it out of pride and arrogance? I'm the head. Does that make you comfortable, men, knowing that part of your job is part of your is the sanctification of your process? You are actually there to help them along with it. Enjoy that on Judgment Day, guys. I tremble at that thought. In order to present it to himself a splendid assembly, not having spot or wrinkle or any of this sort, but that it might be set apart and blameless. In this way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. You know, this is why self within a marriage is very destructive because both are to die to self. Like the husband's men, you're to die to self and for your wives. But yes, the women are to submit themselves back. So who's serving who? And one of the biggest problems I see is when one of the spouses is serving self and the other. And what you end up is with mixture. And we, we know what Yah says about mixture. For no one has ever hated his own flesh and feeds it and cherishes it, as also the master does the assembly. Husbands, love and cherish your wives. Because we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. For this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined, and the two shall become one flesh. This secret is great, but I speak concerning Messiah and the assembly. This verse, look, this is why I've chosen this verse as the intro for the teachings, because this verse covers just about everything. It covers authority. It covers discipleship. It covers fellowship dynamics. It covers everything. It's such an all-encompassing verse when you truly understand what it covers. However, you too, everyone, let each one love his own wife as himself. Let the wife see that she fears her husband. All of what we're speaking about today is supposed to be teaching us a greater shadow picture. Sorry, a greater weightier picture, the spiritual picture, which is Messiah and his bride. Again, though, what does it mean that the two shall become one flesh? Give me practical application, Michael. Okay. One of the crucial elements of the two becoming one is trust. Wives, to submit to your husbands, do you need to trust them? You betcha. Husbands, do you need to be able to trust your wives? You betcha. Now let's ask the question, does Elohim need to be able to trust us? Of course. If not, he's not going to give us authority in the age to come. The two becoming one is built on a foundation of trust. 
which involves uh, faith, actually. It involves faith in the biblical sense. Do you have faith in your wife? Do you have faith in your husband? Why is one party like so now we're going to look at some more practical questions if there's dysfunctionality and all these types of things. Why is one party not trusting the other? There's always going to be a reason when you peel back the layers, there's always an underlying issue as to why one may not be fully trusting in the other. Is one party genuinely untrustworthy? I find that this is quite rare, generally. But maybe one party is genuinely untrustworthy. Oh, the husband is gambling away all the money. Blah, you know, I'm using extreme examples. Oh, the wife, you know, she doesn't look after the kids. She's too busy, busy socializing, drinking wine. I, I don't know, like, hypothetically speaking, do they have a character flaw? Like, I don't know. But I found that someone to be genuinely untrustworthy, like at the character level, is very rare. Usually you're dealing with brokenness or emotional baggage and people not having been raised up correctly and not having been given the life skills to operate in a functional sense. That's genu generally the reason. Brokenness, EAD, things like that. If one party is genuinely untrustworthy through behavior, well, what are they doing about it? And I believe this is where overcoming through the discipleship and walking in community is, is critical here. Because if you walk in community and you walk, and I'm not talking hippie commune here, uh, but if you're walking as a body, the body holds itself accountable one to another. And when you become close with certain people, you start to give them the authority to speak into your life. And if they see something in you, right? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall surely reprove him if he needs it in meekness and humility. But from what I've seen over the time that I've been serving the body, it's very rare that someone is genuinely untrustworthy at the character level. More often than not, you're dealing with um, brokenness, brokenness and not having been equipped properly. You hear Curtis and I talk about EAD a lot. And I believe one of the, th this is the biggest thing that we have to contend with, EAD, emotionally arrested development. So in some areas in our emotional makeup, we've actually become stunted and we're like children. We get frozen in time in that particular area of our lives. Think of EAD as the overarching term for all types of EAD. There's many different types of EAD. Um, I've put here UBS, past trauma projecting. Okay. UBF stands for unbearable feeling. This is a term that's used in counseling and psychological kind of circles. Okay. And an unbearable feeling is something like, let's say you it's some it's a feeling that you cannot bear you like you will do anything possible to not have to experience that emotion or feeling so some people they cannot stand to be rejected rejection is an unbearable feeling and let's say you have rejection issues your behavior will now dictate what you do so you don't feel rejection so what, So if you've got rejection issues, one of the ways that that can manifest is that uh, you will go out of your way to be, say, the center of attention. You want to please everyone. You become a yes man or yes woman at your own expense. Um, it may actually lead to promiscuous behavior because you want to be accepted. You can't bear to feel rejected. And you will do absolutely anything, usually subconsciously and unknowingly, to avoid that feeling of rejection. You know, for some people, it will be they don't want, uh, they hate being nagged like to, like, or being corrected. They absolutely cannot be corrected. They can't do wrong, okay? And the way that that will manifest is that they always have to be right and they will belittle people and they will, they will go out of their way to show how amazing they are. Now, these can be caused by past trauma. Look, everyone knows that someone who's been through a traumatic experience has psychological issues, okay? That's a type of EAD, okay? Emotionally arrested development. Um, and 
you know, what that will do, that will lead you to projecting, uh, you, you end up projecting these things onto other people. So, for example, um, I'm trying to think of a, let's say a woman in a previous marriage was cheated on by her husband. Let's say he he was out all the time and it turns out that he was committing adultery with her. They break her, but now she remarries. That will It's highly likely that she will now be a little bit controlling. Where are you going? Don't spend too much time away from me. And what it what she's unknowingly doing is projecting her past traumas onto her current husband. And the men have got their own stuff to deal with. You know, th th remember, this can go both ways. And as a result of, say, UBFs or past traumas, you end up having these unhealthy thinking patterns. So let's use the woman that's being cheated on. And let's say her second husband is genuinely late home from work. What is she now going to be thinking? Oh, no. What if he's meeting a colleague from work? And what if they're in a hotel room? You know, like, and you can see this starting to form. Now, do you now think that that woman who's been cheated on in the past is going to fully trust her husband? No. And he's done nothing wrong. And he's wondering, well, what's going on? Why is she being so demanding? Why is she being so clingy? Why is she, do you know what I mean? Like, and he's got no idea that actually the, the behavior is just an outcome of an underlying issue, okay? Everyone's got something that, you know, some people can't stand being uh, shamed, you know, the shame of something. Uh, or here's a good one for men, the fear of failure. Men hate failing. And understandably so, no one likes to fail. So how will that manifest itself? Well, either you become, uh, you overcompensate. So you, you become quite OCD and obsessive compulsive to make sure everything's bish, bash, bosh. Or you don't try at all. And you just become apathetic and your life is stalled because you're not willing to push further for fear of making a mistake. Okay. And then all, all of, and, and then how would a, a woman marry to a husband like that thing? Well, why do you not do anything? Go and do something with your life. Not realizing that he's actually got a problem. He, he, he cannot, feel, he, he dare not feel making a mistake. Or let's say it goes the other way. He becomes OCD, hyper controlling. The woman is going to be like, you know, she actually runs the risk of being subjugated because the husband, for fear of making a mistake, has to have everything so rigidly contained that the woman then becomes put in like an emotional prison. Are the two parties now going to trust each other? And if not, are they actually going to become one? No. By the way, this is really broad. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is one's EAD hitting the others, thus a vicious cycle begins. So let's use the example of the woman. Her ex-husband has cheated on her. He was always off out. So what she does now, she makes sure that her husband is always at home and she ends up, you know, it's coming across as being clingy and controlling and all of this. Now, let's say that the husband had a very controlling mother right? The mother wouldn't let him get away with anything, very harsh. What do you think is going to happen? The woman's trauma is now coming out in the behavior that she's being clingy and needy and protective and not allowing the husband to go out. Well, now that's triggering the husband's past trauma of having a controlling, unhealthy mother. So now he bites back and says, what are you doing, woman? I'm going out the house. You're not controlling me. Now, and do you see, now it becomes a back and forth and these two EAD cycles uh, and this vicious cycle begins and then it blows up. All of this because of EAD, emotionally arrested development. And for, for each one of us, EAD comes in a vast array of things, a vast array. How do you know if you've got an unbearable feeling? If you're, if you, your reaction to something is abnormal and you go to great lengths to not feel something. Do you give your best to your spouse? 
Remember the order of structure. Ya, spouse, children, self. Do you actually give the best to your spouse or do you give it to your employers, friends or family? You know, husbands, you're particularly prone to this if you're the sole breadwinner. When you come back home from work, do you actually have something left to give to your wife? And if you don't, what do you think that's going to do to your wife over time? She will start to feel like you don't value her. And then you'll be like, but I can't do anything else. I'm putting bread on the table and it just is. And then you think that your wife has been ungrateful. And all it's to like, it's not whether one's ungrateful or cherished. It's just, have you, are you giving something? You know, wives, it can go the same way. You know, here in the UK, there's this very common, uh, well, I guess it's the same in the US as well, uh, pub culture. The man goes to work, he comes back home, he goes to the pub after dinner, uh, sorry, after work, and then he goes home and falls asleep. The wife is not getting anything. But, you know, let's now go over to the women. Women that um, all they want to do is spend time with their girlfriends. And actually, the girlfriends of the wife are more important than the husband. What do you think the husband is going to think? Do you see what I mean? Are you actually number one in each other's life? Why would you trust someone like that? Of course, that's going to start to build distrust. Do you actually have anything left to give to your spouse at the end of the day? Or in general? Look, there's a part of me that no one else gets but my wife. And that's not me being horrible to the rest of you. It's the way it ought to be. Like, look at the shadow picture. Um, when a man and a wife come together physically, they take off their clothes. You wouldn't do that in front of anyone. In fact, you would guard the nakedness of your spouse, right? You do that in the physical, so why are you not doing it in the emotional and spiritual? There's a part of me that only my wife sees emotionally and spiritually and vice versa. That's the way it ought to be. And this is one of the biggest ways to instill trust in one another and to for the other to feel cherished because the spouse knows that they have a piece of you that no one else does. And unfortunately, this is not the case in a lot of marriages. Is your spouse number one in your life? This is what it boils down to, bar the king, obviously. That goes without say. But on an earthly level, on a human interaction level, is your spouse number one? Look, if you have busy patches at work, you know, look, it, it's not perfect all the time. You do get seasons where you've got to give more. That I, I'm not talking of that. I'm talking broadly here. Broadly. Is one party under exhaustion? So let's say you got the, the husband being the sole breadwinner and he's got a family of seven kids to feed, right? That's very expensive in the inflationary environment we're in right now. So he's having to pick up the flack at work, but doing the extra hours, he then comes back. He's got he's completely exhausted. And the wife is like, honey, I'd like to spend a bit of time with you. What do you think is going to happen to the husband? Either he'll snap. Thus, the woman now feels not cherished, or he's going to feel guilty and shamed because he knows that he's not able to do this for the time being. Like, maybe both parties, mutual exhaustion, maybe both the husband and the wife, and I'm not talking just physical exhaustion here, I'm talking emotional exhaustion. You know, look, it can be tough, and if you're in that place and then you're biting one another, you know, with your words and all this, think back to what we read in First Peter 3. Seek peace. Do not let evil come from your mouth. Do not return evil for evil. And all this being in the context of marriage, pursue peace. All of these things will hamper at the trust level. And if you hamper the trust level, you watch a wedge being driven between the husband and the wife. Usurping from in-laws, close-knit families, children, leadership, etc. So 
is there usurping from the in-laws? In-laws are, are, are notoriously bad for doing this. Getting sticking their noses into the into their children's marriages. It's none of your business. Thank you very much. You know, and what happens is that I don't know, let's say, let's say my mother-in-law was putting weird ideas in my wife's head and my wife decided to act on that. Who's now running the marriage? My mother-in-law. Let's say my mother-in-law is putting weird ideas in my head and I act on them. Who's now who's now controlling the marriage? Like my mother-in-law. Uh, sorry, my mother. So now if you know that the spouse is going to take the in-law's word over your own, can you trust them? It literally attacks the trust. You know, some people are very close to their brothers and sisters, their blood brothers and sisters, and they will take their advice first over discussing something with their spouse for whatever reason. How about children? You know, the, the, why, the, the, the women are more prone to this. It's all about the kids. It's all about the kids. You know, especially when it comes to the disciplining of kids and the disciplining of children. Let's say the father says, no, this has to happen. They need to learn their lesson. And the wife is pandering to the children behind the scenes. Can the husband trust the wife's disciplinary action? No, he can't. And then that breeds distrust between the two. How about leadership? Assembly and church leadership. Man, go look at Christianity to see the fruit of this. And Judaism, actually, because the rabbi's word will supersede the husband's word in Judaism. Like, what's the point of having, like, let's say that the leadership is usurping your marriage. Well, what's the, is there even a point in addressing the issue? Because you know the leadership is going to usurp it anyway. So then you end up in this hopeless place where you think, well, what's the point? Has the spouse truly left the nest? Men, women do not like a mummy's boy. They do not. It's, it's not attractive. You know, and like, especially now in the modern day, we have a lot of so called men that are still mummy's boys. It's like, have you left the nest? But this is equally true of women. Have they left the nest? Are you still trying to please your parents? when their job as a parent is technically done. Because if the spouse truly hasn't left the nest, you've now married three people. You've married your spouse and their parents. You wouldn't bring them into your marriage bed, but why are you doing it in your marriage? Codependency with children, oh boy. The women are more prone to this as well. You see this thing of, you know, I've come across this a few times. This is particularly bad in Rome, actually, but uh, I wanted a daughter and God gave me a best friend. You know, or men, actually, I wanted a son and God gave me a project, right? The men are equally to blame on this. Your children are not your friends. They're your children. <laughs> like, the minute you put them on the level with, like, it, it causes all kinds of usurping. Like, again, like, your worth should be coming from Messiah first and your spouse second. Your job over children is to raise them up, not to become codependent with them, because one day they're going to leave the nest. What are you going to do then? Unhealthy, deep emotional connections and or obsessions with others than your spouse. Again, remember, like we're talking about what is it that's going to break trust in a marriage? To make the point, exes, best, okay, so, you know, how well does it work in a marriage if you're trying to say to your wife or your husband, well, my ex, I really like what they did here, and I really admired this about their character, it's like, <laughs> that's going to attack your partner's self-worth, it's going to make them feel this big, and then you expect things to be hunky-dory, best friends of the opposite sex. Like, if your spouse has a best friend of the opposite sex, nip that in the bud. 
Like, look, you, you read of the horror stories that happens in Rome. Like, I don't need to go into the, into this to tell you why this is a bad idea. Because let's say that the husband and the wife now have a tiff and one of them goes to the best friend of the opposite sex and it's like, oh, they're not listening to me. He or she is doing that. And the best friend is going there, there, there. Like, we hear the story all the time and then they ends up with adultery. By the way, this happens with the pastor or the rabbi usurping the marriage as well. Oh, my husband, he's not listening. Oh, thank you, pastor. You understand me. Before you know it, there's an affair going off. Close-knit family members as well. Like, the, the point that I'm trying to say is, again, is your spouse number one? Is your spouse, you know... You hear this in the unbelieving world, like, oh, I have my husband or my wife and my soulmate who's of the opposite sex. Like, really? That's a recipe for adultery. I'm not saying you can't have friends of the opposite sex, but again, I hope people hear where I'm coming from. All of this will break the trust at the marriage level. And if there's no trust, you are not becoming one. By the way, everything that I'm saying applies at the spiritual level. You know, the father, Yah is saying, I want you to have eyes for me and no one else. I want you to keep my commands. Don't add or take away. And what's the picture being painted? Well, uh, you know, I, 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 I'll be with you, Elohim, but I'm going to have a dip in this bed every so often. Like, how would that work in the marriage level? Becoming one. Talking versus communicating. <laughs> one of my favorite sayings is that you can talk an awful lot without actually communicating. I actually have people, you know, they they, they talk to me for half an hour and I come away looking, I, I come away and think, what was actually said? They didn't actually say anything. Why? Because they were talking, not communicating. Talking is a one-way thing, whereas communication is reciprocal. It goes both ways, which means, guess what? You have to listen to the other person and communicate back. Men are particularly bad at this. We have this thing called selective hearing. <laughs> selective hearing. True communication requires taking the mask off and actually bearing one's soul. Think of the spirit man teaching that I did recently where, where um, religion keeps us in that fleshly place without going to the heart level. You know, look, you can talk till you're blue in the face about what, you know, how the garden needs to be excavated and what bills need to be paid and, you know, what you're going to put on the table for dinner tonight and blah, 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 blah. This is all fleshly stuff. Yes, it needs to be dealt with. But when was the last time that husbands and wives, you actually sat down and bared each other's soul to each other? Oh, you're more than happy to take off your clothes and have sex together, but you won't do it at the emotional level. There's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. You know, men particularly struggle with this because um, I use the phrase that men can be emotionally constipated, you know, like because of whatever cultural ideas we have or because we, you know, this macho spirit that can be in some people, we can't seem to show emotion and we, we, we struggle or maybe we've got trust issues because of being burnt in the past. The point is, if you're not going to actually bear yourself to your partner on the emotional level, you're just do, you're playing pleasantries. And that's where the two become truly one. Remember that your flesh is going to die. It's going to die. So what's happening at the heart level? And the amount of couples I see not going to this place you know, and then the women will say, well, tell me how you're feeling, darling. And the man just closes off. What your, what your wife is wanting from you there, she wants to know you. Not the fleshly outward thing. She actually wants to know you at an emotional level. 
But ladies, when the husband is asking, what's wrong, darling? And you say, nothing, I'm fine. <laughs> it's the same thing. They want to know what's actually going on at the emotional level. This is where communication truly occurs. Talking is at the flesh level, garden, bills, friends, social life. Communication happens at the soul level. Spouses must know each other's past traumas, all this. If they've got traumas, you must know it. Because if not, you're going to remember that trauma and EAD will lead to behavior, okay, and weirdness. And the problem is, is that we look at the behavior and the weirdness as the problem. These are symptoms of something going on under the surface. You know, people that have been in abusive relationships have trust issues, and understandably so. Okay, because they've been abused, they've been broken, all this kind of stuff. But then the spouse needs to be aware, okay, this is what I'm up against. It's not a deal breaker, but just know. Because again, if not, you're not going to become one at the soul level. What emotional spiritual, and spiritual baggage is each party bringing to the marriage? Because... If you don't know what's actually the drivers in your spouse's behavior and thinking, you're, you're going to be playing whack-a-mole all the time and not actually deal with the issue at the heart of it. The problem is, is that we live in an age where most people have not actually been equipped to that level. So, you know, they, do, they don't even know themselves half the time. They know some things up, but they can't pinpoint it. And again, this is where discipleship not only begins at the, at, the, at the marriage level, you've got to bear each other's soul. But if both the husband and wife are not able to go and figure out what's going on at the soul level, that's where they'll need their twos and threes. But again, people are too proud or they're too ashamed to ask for help, which in of itself is a form of EAD. Disagreements are inevitable. How do you deal with them? I once heard a saying that if you think you're not going to have a disagreement, someone's not thinking. <laughs> Disagreements, are, they're going to happen. You're both fallen. How are you going to deal with it? Are you going to backbite one another? Are you going to let your EAD govern the whole situation? Fine, keep at it. See where that gets you. How are you going to deal with them? <clears throat> Did you know that disagreements actually have the ability to make you even more one? Because as you work things out, not only will you learn about each other, but your bond and love should grow. Thus, you become more one. This is why marriages that have gone through fires or that where the husband and the wife have come together through a trial, like th that brings them closer together. Are both parties being heard? And I mean actually being heard. I, and I'm talking in the light of communication. Because if one party is trying to communicate and the other one is just talking back, one party is not being heard. Let me say this. Disagreement does not equal not listening. I've had people say to me, Michael, you, like more in the serving the body kind of sense, Michael, you're not listening to me. You're not listening. It's like, no, I'm listening to every word you say. I just don't agree with you. You know, so bear this in mind. Just because this is disagreement doesn't mean it's not listening. It just means I've listened. I don't agree. So wives, when you say something to your husband, he says, well, I don't think so. That doesn't mean he didn't hear Okay, now back the other way. Husbands, when your wife says, I don't agree, that doesn't mean she's not listening. Again, broad brush stroke. EAD will totally hijack this process. You know, again, like I've had people say to me while I've been serving the body, Michael, you're not listening to me. And they've mistaken that disagreement does not mean I'm not listening. And actually what this highlights is a fear of being wrong. But and maybe self a whole other topic. But if you 
like think about this your husband disagrees with you and you now think well he's obviously not listening to me or do you know what I mean the other way around if you're going to play in EAD land this whole process is hijacked which means that again you're not going to be able to work your differences out and come together and become one is one party swallowing outcomes just to keep the peace that's not submission and I'm talking about just when this is continual. This is, if you leave this point long enough, you will get resentment that will lead to subjugation. One party will become subjugated and start feeling resent. In fact, yeah, this will lead to resentment. You know, this is more common when you have a story like Abigail and Naval, right? Uh, a husband that's deal that's treating his headship like a like a dictatorship okay and the wife slowly starts being subjugated which is not good and then resentment starts to build either it will go in the thing where she'll flip out and or she will become emotionally scarred and damaged you know it, it's not healthy but this can be the, you know look men have suffered this in past marriages where the wife is you know and, and they just keep swallowing and like and this is being a doormat and it's not biblical it's not biblical matthew 18 right matthew 18 should be happening within marriages we don't think of that do we do you know how to love your spouse do you actually know how to love your spouse because last time I checked, every human being is different. Every human being is different. Do they feel appreciated and cherished? And if not, why not? If the other party is not feeling appreciated and cherished, whose fault is that? Generally, it's the one who's dropping the, the, the ball. Generally. Now, if there's EAD on the other party, things get a bit messy. Let's, you know... If the other party is not appreciated and cherished, resentment will come. It, it, it's just, if A, if one plus one equals two, then this is just human behavior. It's only a matter of time that if, you, if you're not appreciated and cherished long enough, you will feel resentment. And then you'll start weeping to everybody else and going everywhere else for counsel, or you just bottle it all up and become a victim. Who here has heard of the five love languages? Um, this is a common thing that's again taught in the counseling thing. Now, look, I'm not saying, you know, that there's been several books written on this by Christian authors. I'm not here to condone the uh the Christian author uh maybe doctrinal views that these authors have but look some women are very touchy-feely others are not same with men like people like being loved in different ways and these generally this in the psychological places this is what they've broken it down words of affirmation so being spoken to and being told you know i appreciate what you've done well done for this um quality time so time spent together physical touch acts of service receiving gifts you know everyone loves to be loved in different ways some people will have only one of these some people will have multiple of these do you know how your partner loves to be loved do you know how because again i o over the years like the, the physical touch one is a really easy one to pick on some people love being touched, like they crave touch and that's, you know, they just need it. But other people, they're like, go away. That's not how you love them, right? And that's okay. Like everyone's got their way of being loved. The reason I'm bringing this up is not so you can like, you know, it's do you know how to love your partner? Have you actually thought about what is it that my partner likes? Have you asked them? Here's the other one. Have you taught your spouse how to love you? <laughs> Have you said, dear, I appreciate you trying to do this, but I'd rather you did that. 
Have you actually told your spouse how to love you? Or are you leaving them to guess? Because you've got this romanticized Hollywood idea of what a marriage ought to be. You know, he needs to get the hint. Ladies, you're, you're more guilty of this. He needs to just know. He just needs to know how I'm to be loved. It's like... <laughs> I don't know, ladies, if you've noticed, but men can be a bit slow on the uptake on this one. It, it's literally going against our design. It's literally like, remember, ladies, you are very highly emotionally attuned. We're not as emotionally attuned as you, you are. And this is why we're able to be good in a more disciplinary kind of sense, because it doesn't affect our emotions. It's like, well, he brought it upon himself. Whereas the ladies are like, oh, you know, look, disciplining a puppy. Ladies really struggle with that. Men don't. The little puppy peed on my carpet. It got what it's coming. <laughs> and the lady will be like, oh, but he's so cute. The point I'm bringing all this up, though, is like, who told you that the man or the spouse just needs to get the hint? If that's what you think, you've watched too many Hollywood romantic movies. I'm just going to say it. Hollywood has, it has affected your view of marriage. Look at the ancient Hebrew wedding model. What would happen? The, while the two were, um, were um, betrothed to one another, the husband would go prepare a place. And what would the wife be learning? What pleased her husband? She didn't have to guess. When they got married and consummated, she knew what she had to do. This is how my husband loves me. This is what he's expecting of me and vice versa. The husband knew about his wife. Let me throw this out there. Elohim has taught us how to love him. It's called your Torah. If you want me to be your Elohim, this is how I want you to be as my people. If Elohim has taught us how to love him, why are you not teaching your spouse, which you're supposed to be a type and shadow of Elohim and his bride, why are you not teaching them how to love you? Wives, if you feel that your husband is not cherishing you, but you've not actually given him a helping hand, you've brought it, you, you, you are part to blame. I will say the same things to the husbands as well. It takes two to tango. However, here's a curveball in all this. Words of affirmation, quality of time, physical touch, acts of service, receiving gifts. There is a curveball in this that sometimes these can be feeding a type of EAD. So let's say, let's say a... Um, someone was they had parents that were very non-demonstrative and they never got the physical touch and cuddles and stuff that they needed as a child and the way that that manifests in the husband or the wife is that they now become clingy and needy and constantly needing touch like there is a point where these things can become a form of feeding some type of ead like you know, or for example, let's use the quality time. Let's go back to the example. There's the wife in her previous marriage. Her husband was out after work all the time. She finds out that he was having an affair. They divorce. And now she remarries. And now she's constantly wanting quality time with a quality time. What is it that that's actually feeding? It's feeding the fact that she's got an EAD problem of it, it like, it's a fear thing. You know that this is feeding some type of EAD when it becomes insatiable. It, 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 you cannot, no matter what you do, you need more and more and more and more. So, be, you know, th this is something to watch out for. The marriage will only be as healthy and functional as the mental and spiritual growth of both parties. It just is. <laughs> it just is. And if this brings up this idea of overcoming, a.k.a. the renewing of the mind, a.k.a. circumcision of the heart, if the either party are not undergoing at this process, the marriage will not grow as quickly as it ought to. 
if both parties, the husband and the wife, are children emotionally, the marriage will remain in a childlike state. Marriages die by a thousand cuts. You don't just wake up and suddenly, boom, it's gone. It's a bit, one bit of VAD there, a snarky comment there, a bit of backbiting there, someone running away from responsibility here, and it builds up and it builds up and it snowballs. And then neither party is taking initiative to try and fix the issue. And boom, and before you know it, the marriage is on the rocks and they're going for counseling. You don't just suddenly wake up with an affair. You don't just suddenly wake up with marriage problems. It happens bit by bit. But if the parties are not bearing themselves at the soul level, how on earth are they ever going to know what's actually truly going on? Go back to the story of Abraham and Sarah. What, what were they not doing? Go into the soul level. Abraham, I think we need to give Elohim a helping hand. Well, actually, what Abraham should have realized, my wife has a faith issue. Let's walk this out. Let's clean it with the washing of the water of the word. You know, Abraham, this is your fault. He should have gone, well, maybe it was partially my fault, but you spearheaded this. Like, again, it, bit by bit, it takes two to tango. You know, is one party sometimes more to blame? Yes. And sometimes there are issues when one party is genuinely trying their best and the other party is just being, it is not caring at all. That does happen. But again, I, I find that more often than not, that there's issues on both sides and things have snowballed. Victim mentality will lead to resentment and eventually divorce. Look, sometimes, and I mean this in the sense of, look, I'm not talking of the extremes here. Some people have had abuse in marriage. Some people, you know, whatever that abuse, I'm not talking of that type of victim mentality. People that have experienced an abusive marriage, they are genuine victims. They, they need to be helped. I, so I'm not talking of that. I'm talking about a marriage, you know, dying by a thousand cuts, a little bit here, a little bit there. And this thing of, well, I've tried and why is he not listening? And why is she not? And look at how hard done by I am. This is the type of victim mentality I'm talking about. Okay. Because if you stay in that place, it will lead to resentment. Oh, look at him go doing his thing again. Oh, look at her go talking to her friends. You know, where does it, like, when, are, when are we going to stop acting like children? Playing to each other's strengths does not equal usurping. Okay. <laughs> in, in the idea of two becoming one, um, I'll give a really good example. I'll use my own marriage as an example. My wife is a former accountant. Before she decided to do full time, to serve full time, my wife was training to be a chartered accountant, which means that her budgeting skills are par excellence. So in this household, my wife is in charge of the budget. Believe me. Now, her if you left the budget to me, <laughs> we wouldn't have as many of the things that we need, shall we say, okay? But my wife's strength is budgeting, is numbers, is, look, my wife is very good at organizational skills, whereas I'm very much the type of person that, ah, oh, we'll play things by ear. If you left certain things like the planning of a holiday and uh, you left it to me, ah, oh, let's just kind of work it out, the holiday wouldn't be as good. I'm fully aware of my shortcomings in these areas. And I do try to, you know, and I've been proved, but it's like, you know what, Ruth, you, you are the one with the strength in these areas. I'm giving you that authority. You take care of it. Now, so my wife is in charge of the budget. My wife is very good at organizing the itinerary, shall we say. Is she now usurping me? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So I, I make this point because, you know, just because 
it, to make the point, there are times, because my wife is a better budgeter than I am, I have to submit sometimes to certain things my wife says. So, for example, my wife doesn't seem to think that me buying a £2,000 guitar fits in the budget. I don't know why. <laughs> but we have more important things right now that we need to be putting money aside for. You know, inflation is going up. We've just had to replace our boiler. Like, my, my the service on the car is coming up. So I will submit to my wife and say, you know what, honey, I don't think we need the new guitar right now. I can do without the new guitar. I will submit because I know you're a better budgeter than me. But if I was to now use my headship and abuse it and say, well, I'm the head of the house and I will be much happier with my new guitar. And if I'm happy, you're happy. Do you see the point that I'm trying to make? Playing to each other's strength does not mean usurping. Look, women are generally better homemakers. They know how to run the house like a clockwork. And then the man comes in and tries to help and he screws things up. It breaks up the order. You know, there's nothing wrong with the woman taking the lead for, for lack of better words on certain plate. The point I'm saying is play to your strengths. Now, just because my wife is better at budgeting doesn't mean that I'm not part of the decision-making process. Do you see what I mean? I'm still actively involved, but there are times when she says, Michael, no new guitar, and I go, okay. <laughs> Do you see the point? This is why I say that sometimes, we again, everyone talks about the wife submitting to the husband, but what about where the husband has to submit to the wife? It doesn't take away his headship role. It doesn't take away his headship role. I still very much have headship over the Omen residence, just that I will play to my wife's strength. She is my helpmeet. Where I am weak, she is strong, and vice versa. I would be a fool not to give her that authority. A fool. Speaking up in a disagreement does not equal usurping. <laughs> this is for you, ladies. There are times where my wife has said to me, Michael, I don't seem to think that, you know what I mean? She spoke up. The way she does it is definitely not usurping. There's nothing like, again, submission and subjugation are very different things. Husbands, if, you, if you're not like taking into consideration your wife's line of sight, you're losing something. You know, there have been times, because women are more emotionally attuned, my wife will sense something in someone before I do. And initially, I'll be like, well, Ruth, no, you're being too emotional about it. And then a couple of months later, I have to eat my hat and go, you know what? She was right. And because this happened a couple of times now, when my wife, when her, when her niggles come, I start to listen now. But I'm still the one that's overseeing, but I'm taking into consideration my wife is noticing something. I best keep my ear, you know, keep your ear to the ground sort of thing. Something's up. Submission does not equal losing your personality. You're still allowed to be you. You know, my wife and I have very clear uh, personality differences. And we celebrate each other's differences. It enriches our marriage. You know, let's apply this at the Elohim level. People think that being conformed into the image of Messiah means that you can't be you. That's not what he, Yah doesn't want robots. He's the one that created diversity, true biblical diversity. Notice how the world has tried to turn that upside down, right? Look at the variety of characters and emotions and in creation, the amount of variety and the, the beauty and richness it brings. Submission does not equal losing your personality. Losing your personality means subjugation. Submission versus subjugation and being a doormat. Look, again, like I said, these are very different things. A healthy marriage will have a balance of power. And what I mean by that, again, my wife will be in charge of the budget. In fact, my wife has the most 
sw- she can sway my opinion more than any other human being because of the uh, because i respect her as a co-heir of life to come again this doesn't take away the role of the husband being the head you know i i think it's safe to say in this community especially where the hu- the, the wives are looking after the children at home husbands i bet you're glad your wife has the running of the house don't up this is all i'm talking about ead will hijack biblical submission it will totally hijack it is one party again swallowing outcomes to keep the peace because that's not submission look there is a time to bite your tongue we saw that with abigail she decided not to tell naval while he was drunk what happened she waited till the following morning there is a time, you know, you know what I mean? Wait until emotions have died down. I'm talking about constantly being turned into a doormat here. Passive aggression will lead to usurping and dysfunctionality. Again, if you're not bearing each other's problems at the soul level, if you're not rectifying disagreements and resentment starts to build, that will lead to start, you know, passive aggression. And then that will lead to usurping by one party going for advice somewhere. Right? And it just creates dysfunctionality. Keeping the peace will lead to war. Have both parties truly been heard again? You know, Elohim wants us to do Matthew 18 with him. Why can't we do it at the marriage level? A marriage occurring under the wrong conditions is not an excuse for the failure of said marriage. Some people got married under bad circumstances. But that can it be a contributing factor to the uh, the breaking down of marriage? Yeah, sure. But I've put here: Do you live in the present for to live for the future? Like again, the past is the past. What are you going to do now? Some of you right now tuning in or watching on YouTube may be having problems in your marriage. Okay, that's in the past. You can't change that. What are you going to do now? Are you going to peel back the layers and, and find the EAD that's driving the weird behavior and stuff? Are you actually going to start communicating and bearing each other's hearts once again? Any marriage can be brought back from the precipice, and there's one condition to this, that both parties are committed. If there's commitment from both parties, a marriage can be brought back. But if there if there's one party or either party not committed, well, you're wasting your time. Oh man. Let's quickly read through this. It's not very long. I want to quickly show some things. This is the um I apologize for going long. <laughs> Genesis 29. This is when Jacob or Israel has all his children. He also went into Rachel, and he also loved Rachel more than Leah. And he served with Levan or Laban another seven years. And Yah saw that Leah was unloved, and he opened her womb, and Rachel was barren. And Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuven, or Reuben. For she said, Yah has looked on my affliction, because now my husband is going to love me. Jacob did not love Leah like he ought to. And she felt it. She was not being loved and cherished. And she's actually naming her child because of that. Reuven means see a son. Behold a son. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, because Yah has heard that I am unloved, he gave me this son too. And she called his name Shimon. Shimon means heard or hearing. It comes from the word Shema. So, her husband's not listening to her, but Yar is. Notice how the kids are being brought into this. Imagine your name being a symbol of your parents' dysfunctionality. Ah, oh, gee, thanks. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, Now this time my husband is joined to me because I have borne him three sons. So his name was called Levi. Levi means twine to or joined to. She's literally saying, my husband and I are not one. Why are we not one? Like, I actually feel sorry for Leah in all this. Because 
She, do you know what I mean? She didn't ask any of this. She just wants to be one with her husband. I can understand that. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I praise Yah. So she called his name Yehuda, and she sees bearing. Again, Yehuda means praised or celebrated. And when Rachel saw that she bore Yaakov no children, Rachel envied her sister. Oh boy, here we go. Here start the games. And said to Yaakov, give me children or else I am going to die. And Yaakov's displeasure burned against Rachel. So again, like, are we seeing a functional marriage here? No, we're not. He's not loving his wife. He's not cherishing her. She's losing the background of her mind. Am I in the place of Elohim who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb? So now he's passing the buck on to the woman. You know, that's that same old thing. And she said, see my female servant, Bill, her go into her and let her bear for me and let me be built up from her as well. Obviously, they're not learning from Abraham and Sarah's mistake, right? Let's take matters into our own hands yet again. Go into the female servant. How did that fare out last time? So she gave for him Bila, her female servant, as wife, and Yaakov went into her. And Bila conceived and bore Yaakov as son. And Rachel said, Elohim has rightly ruled my case and has also heard my voice and given me a son. So she called his name Dan. Dan means judge. Like, imagine being called judge, like, literally, this is Rachel's pity party against her. In fact, let's keep going. Rahel's female servant, Bilha, conceived again and bore Yaakov a second son. And Rahel said, with great wrestlings, I have wrestled with my sister and I have overcome. So she called his name Naphtali. Naphtali literally means my wrestling. Imagine being called after that. You have two sisters that are battling it out against each other, and Rachel has the hubris to say she's overcome. The whole time she's naming her kid, I have wrestled. <laughs> this is the picture of a dysfunctional marriage. And it's again, this is why, you know, anyway, whole other story, the whole thing of having one wife only. Leah saw that she had seized bearing, and she took Zilpah, her female servant, and gave her... It wasn't enough that Leah had had four kids of her own, and Rachel's children were actually through the, 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 the maidservant. Leah now needs to one-up Rachel. And Leah called... And Leah's female servant, Zilpah, bore Yaakov a son. And Leah said, fortune comes. So she called his name Gad, or Gad in the Hebrew. Gad means fortune. Leah's female servant, Zilpah, bore Yaakov a second son. And Leah said, I am happy for the daughters called me happy. So she called his name Asher. And again, Asher means happy. And Reuven went in the days of the wheat harvest and found love apples in the field, or mandrake, depending what uh, translation you've got, and brought them to his mother, Leah. And Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's love apples. That these were seen to have aphrodisiac qualities, by the way, and to do with fertility. And she said to her, is it a small matter that you have taken away my husband? Would you take away my son's love apples too? You can really see the bickering here and the infighting. And Rachel said, therefore, let him lie with you tonight for your son's love apples. She's literally selling Jacob. Like, <laughs> just... And when Yaakov came out of the field in the evening, Leah went out to meet him and said, do come in to me, for indeed I have hired you with my son's love apples. And he lay with her that night. Wow. Imagine coming, like, that's going to get you in the mood, right? Oh, I've hired you, by the way. Go, come do your duty. <laughs> Elohim listened to Leah, and she conceived and bore Yaakov a fifth son. And Leah said, Elohim has given me my hire because I have given my female servant to my husband. So she called his name Yisas Kha or Yisaka. Yisas Kha means he will bring hire or wages. Imagine being Issachar and you're named after one of your mother selling you, you know, like it's just so messed up. It really is messed up. And Leah conceived again and bore Yaakov a sixth son.
And Leah said, Elohim has presented me with a good present. Now my husband is going to dwell with me because I have borne him six sons. So she called his name Zebulun or Zebulon. Now, Zevulun, there's a word play going on in the Hebrew here because it can mean habitation or dwelling. It can also mean exalted. It can mean to be exalted. So what Leah is saying, now my husband is going to dwell with me or he's going to exalt me. Remember, she's the unloved one because I have borne him six sons. There's a nice bit of Hebrew word play going on there. And afterwards, she bore a daughter and called her name Dinah. Dinar means justice or judgment. Again, like, I have gotten my right judgment because I am the unloved wife. And Elohim remembered Rachel and Elohim listened to her and opened her womb. And she conceived and bore a son and said, Elohim has taken away my reproach. So she called his name Yosef and and said, Yah has added to me another son. Yosef means he will add. Now, When you actually realize what's going on, that all the kids are named after results of infighting between two wives and that there's not an achadness going on, that it's actually quite a sad story. Again, another dysfunctional family. And these are the fathers of the faith. Now, here's what's really interesting. When you take the meanings of the names of the 12 sons of Israel, it points out, it literally lays out the plan of redemption. So it's almost like Yah is able to take something that was bad and turn it around for good. I mean, that's beautiful. Anyway, look, I know this was a long one. But I wanted to give some more practical application as to what it means to become one. And look, these are very broad brushstrokes. Like we can go on and on and on. And I tried to show you some biblical examples where the practical application that I was giving you maybe didn't happen in Abraham and Sarah's life and in, you know, Jacob and Sarah and Leah's, uh, sorry, Jacob, Rachel and Leah's life. But... Here's the thing. Do if we claim to surrender to Elohim, then that means that in marriage we need to surrender one to another. And our fallen state and our EAD literally hijacks this process. Okay. If we claim to be children of the living Elohim and surrender surrendering to his word, are we practicing it in our marriage? Anyway, let's stop here um, and have a break. Next week, I didn't mention this, but all of these things that we've covered today are very much applicable at the assembly level. So we're going to look at the assembly level next week and what does submission within fellowship dynamics looks like and actually how it relates to the marriage covenant. Um, Anyway, let's stop here. Amen.